Welcome to Aurora Public Library's Meet the Candidates event, an information session held in accordance with the library's role in civic engagement. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available for viewing on APL's social media channels. My name is Risha Mandelkorn, and as your host this evening, I will begin by offering a land acknowledgement. We are all immigrants and children of immigrants to Canada. We gratefully acknowledge the original caretakers of this land. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And as we share this space, acknowledging Indigenous nations reminds us of our important connection to this land. I am speaking from the traditional lands and territory of a number of First Nations. This area is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this territory and protect the land. As settlers and newcomers, we have been invited into this treaty of peace, friendship, and respect. In that spirit, we honor all who came before us, our own ancestors, as well as all the Indigenous caretakers, named and unnamed, recorded and unrecorded. Aurora Public Library invited all registered candidates to participate in this evening's event. The yeah. deadline to commit was Friday, April 28th. Some parties did not have registered candidates. And uh, unfortunately, the Conservative candidates from both the Aurora Oak Ridges Richmond Hill and from Newmarket Aurora uh, are not participating this evening. Um, however, we are so pleased to welcome the following candidates who are with us this evening to respond to some of your many wonderful questions. For the riding of Aurora Oak Ridges Richmond Hill, Marjan Kasirlu, Ontario Liberal Party. For the riding of Newmarket Aurora, Carolina Rodriguez, Green Party of Ontario, Sylvain Roy, Ontario Liberal Party, and Dennis Heng, Ontario New Democratic Party. Speaking order was decided by random draw, and I will be rotating questions. So if the candidate was the first to introduce themselves, they will be the last to respond to the first question. And the wrap up at the end will be in the reverse order. Each candidate will be given four minute introduction, three minutes to respond to each question and two minutes to wrap up. Lucy Frechette is working behind the scenes as tech support. Claudia Ogen is our timekeeper. And at one minute, Claudia will hold up the one minute sign, a following warning at 30 seconds. And at time, she will ring the bell Louder, Claudia, you've been practicing all day. <laughs> and Lucy will mute the speaker. Zoom has two options for viewing found at the top right corner of your screen. You can select either gallery view to zoom in on the speaker or speaker view where we will all appear. And you may also enable closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to everyone who submitted wonderful questions for us to pose to the candidates. We will get to as many as we can, but we will have a hard stop at 9 p.m. or after the last candidate wraps up. Candidates have been advised to respect attendees by speaking directly to your questions and were reminded that there is no debate or rebuttal permitted. And now we're going to start with introductory remarks by each candidate, which will be followed by your questions. So uh, up first, if I could please ask Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, Ontario Liberal Party candidate, Marjan Kassirlu to start us off this evening. Thank you so much, Resia, for um, the amazing introduction and um, organization of the event. And thank you, uh, Aurora Public Library, for giving our community to have a chance to meet with the candidates. And uh, I'm so pleased to be here among uh, our colleagues. And um, I would like to start with uh, a little background about myself. I am a registered nurse by profession, and I have been advocate for public health for 
entire my life. And uh, recently I was um, helping with, um, I was involved in the public advocacy with Registered Nurse Association of Ontario uh, and the committee, a resolution committee uh, for, for the organization for Ontario. And uh, it was pleasure moments for us to be able to talk about the issues that we, we uh, hold dear to, to ourselves as nurses, the social determinants of health. And the fact that every aspect of life would, um, you know, will impact our health uh, as uh, as human, you know, uh, the income, the housing, the um, inclusivity in the society, how we are taking care of each other, and our environment. Uh, those are really important aspect of our life. Uh, the um, education, how we are taking care of our kids are really important. And um, throughout these advocacies, I have helped, I have a um, hard time to sometimes get involved to not be uh, critical uh, uh, about the um, um, some, some um, misunderstanding of the information that we share with the politicians. And uh, once the COVID hit, uh, it actually shone a light on how we are actually um, going backward with uh, the policies that we need to see in, in, our, um, um, in our beautiful Ontario. And that led me to, you know, put my name, name forward for being the voice of the people in Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, in Queen's Park. I believe we need to have the voices of healthcare practitioners in, on the table who knows what it takes to be healthy and what it takes for the people of Ontario to thrive and be um, you know, prosperous. I have a kid in public school and I've seen firsthand how frustrating it could be for the kid, for the you know, families and how tough it has been for the teachers in our um, you know, in Ontario in the last couple of years, um, dealing with um, being, you know, working in a condition which is underfunded knowing that government have not used billions of dollars in, in education and us as a parent are feeling, you know, left out. So this is important issues to me and that, that we need to really work hard on that. In terms of the environment, I, I live in Oak Ridges Moraine. I, I live in Oak Ridges and I believe we need to keep our Oak Ridges Moraine alive for our future generation. So our Ontario Liberal Party has proper plan to protect our environment and work for the healthcare and, and education in Ontario. And we are so blessed that our platform is completely based on the consultation with Ontarian and completely costed based on the current budget you know, proposed by the um, 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 Ford government. And it's going to be really effective tool in hand for us to lead the province. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to talk to you more. Thank you, Marjan. And next for Newmarket Aurora, I'd like to call upon the Green Party candidate, can, uh, candidate Carolina Rodriguez. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Gracia, Lucy, and Claudia for organizing this amazing event and for bringing this really important group of candidates together on Zoom. And thanks to the Aurora Public Library as a whole for hosting what I'm sure will be a super informative event. Thank you for all the other candidates who were able to make it here and address what really matters to the people of Aurora. A little bit about myself. I am a 22 year old student of environmental governance at the University of Guelph. I immigrated to Canada when I was five years old and I grew up in Newmarket. And I'm still privileged to come back to my family home and community as often as I can. Throughout my 22 years, I have been watching and waiting for people to be prioritized over power but I can all no longer wait, and I'm sure many of you can't either. I have watched as forest fires have ravaged the Ontario landscape, and as bills have been placed to limit the amount that we pay our overworked nurses, teachers, and others on the front lines. I have watched as half measures to combat the housing crisis have priced me out of owning a home in Newmarket or Aurora for their foreseeable future. I have also watched as leaders have been focused on the short term telling us that they would be willing to put money back in our pockets, but leaving us with inadequate services, student debt, longer commutes, and legislated poverty. We must understand that the climate crisis is about all of us. We cannot ignore it. 
Aurora and Newmarket have both declared a climate emergency and by investing in retrofitting buildings, electric vehicle subsidies, creating efficient public transit and phasing out fossil fuels, the Greens will assure that municipalities are not left behind. The Green Party is also committed to a holistic investment in the green future to address the cost of living all while be bringing a prosperous climate economy. Our goal for Ontario is to be completely carbon neutral by 2045. This is completely possible and it will not come at the cost of economic growth. Emerging from the challenges and the tragedies that we've all faced throughout the pandemic, I have seen the need for a chance to fix what was broken and adequately care for the people and places that we love. We need to prioritize homes by investing and increasing our supply of affordable housing. We need to ensure that these homes are representative of the families in Aurora and, New and Newmarket, which is why we must also work with municipalities to restructure home, home zoning laws that account for triplexes, fourplexes, tiny homes, and walk-ups. We need to lessen our dependence on cars and create a safer walking, cycling, and e-scootering paths. Mental health. We need to reduce wait times to see mental health professionals because as we have learned, everything is not okay. We need to double the rates of ODSP, the Ontario Disability Support Program, because no one can live off of $1,169 a month in Aurora or Newmarket. We need to support the folks living with addiction, not criminalize them. We will do this with a housing first approach paired with wraparound services and treatment and employment assistance not leaving everyone behind. We need to reinvest in the health and education, and we need to protect our walking trails, local rivers and lakes and drinking water to make sure that we can keep it there for future generations and for myself. My commitment to you all is to do politics differently and to represent every single person in Aurora and in Newmarket. Thank you for your time and I'm excited to get started. Thank you very much, Carolina. And next, for Newmarket Aurora, the Ontario Liberal Party, Sylvain Roy. Well, thank you for the invitation to be with you this evening. And especially, I want to thank the Aurora Public Library for providing us with the opportunity to introduce ourselves to the voters, which in my case would be the great folks of New the writing of Newmarket Aurora. Um, we also get to share a bit about what has motivated us to get uh, to step up to serve you because service is at the heart of why we are all in the, the virtual stage here tonight. So a little bit about me. I did not start off life in the area, which I suppose is a similar story to some of you on a Zoom call tonight. I actually hail from a small community in Northern Ontario called the Nikina, and you can Google it. It does exist. A very small community way up there. And Actually, that's where the road ends. So look it up. Uh, also, like many who um, who don't um, who, who now make New Market or other home, English is not my first language. And and also, like many of you, I made the heart wrenching decision to leave home to pursue my education and career. So I attended York University for my undergrad studies, uh, followed by my postgraduate work in education at McGill, and my doctorate in neuropsychology at the University of Montreal. Uh, and during my university, university studies, I met Sandra and boom, I fell in love with her. She's probably on the call tonight. So good for me to say that as I'm not home a lot these days. Uh, we were married and now have the joy of raising three beautiful children. Um, and so what more could I ask for uh, in life? You know, have a good job that I love and I share life with somebody I love as well. So I chose the field of neuropsychology um, and soon I fell in love with it because quickly I realized the profound difference I could make in the lives of my patients both in the delivery of primary mental health care and advocating as well for the improvement to the delivery of those services. So improved patient care across the board from diagnosis to treatment and recovery is the bottom line for me. So let me offer you a brief example of where this type of advocacy can make a profound difference in the lives of people and the communities where they live. My particular focus as a mental health advocate grew out uh, of treating vulnerable populations with disabilities and severe mental health concerns like schizophrenia, as well as dementia and brain injuries. I discovered a few years ago that 27% of Toronto and York region's homeless population is suspected of having a developmental disability. This information did not appear overnight, nor did the opportunities this knowledge place before us. My role as the president of the Ontario Psychological Association presented me with a wonderful opportunity to advocate at Queen's Park, encouraging government to both understand the issues behind chronic homelessness 
and to address possible solutions. The result of that advocacy was actually a $1 million grant in 2015 to explore the scope of developmental disabilities among the homeless, which led us to discover that 27% figure. The upshot of that discovery was the establishment of an innovative program that significantly sped up access to Developmental Service Ontario. Now, wait times reduced from two years roughly to about to a matter of days and weeks. Clients were enrolled in a program um, basically en ended up having better housing, better primary care and mental health supports resulting in a number of lives saved. The result of that advocacy works remains one of my proudest accomplishments. So you may have guessed that progressive healthcare reform is top of the list for, of priorities for me I want, that I wanna tackle um, and given the opportunity to serve for you at Queen's Park. We also have no short of other issues to discuss in our time together tonight, including the expanding of the hospital infrastructure, creating mental health service hub here in, in, in New Market, and the construction of new schools in a crisis of affordability, particularly as it touches housing, public transit, the green belt and climate initiatives. We are all grappling with the challenges of re recovering from the economic and social burdens brought about by the pandemic, which is a key focus of our business community and citizens alike. So tonight, I look forward to our time together and hearing the questions you ask on the issues that matter to you. So thank you, merci. Thank you very much, Sylvain. So now we're going to move on to Newmarket Aurora for the Ontario New Democratic Party, Dennis Payne. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you to the Aurora Public Library for this opportunity to share how the Ontario NDP will support thriving communities throughout the province. My name's Dennis Hang. I've lived in Aurora since 2007, and I am the NDP candidate for New Market Aurora. As a public health epidemiologist, the natural lens that I use to help me understand our community issues, as well as how we're doing as a society, is this concept of equity. My career has been working towards ways of how to decrease the gap between those that have the most and those that have the least, whether it is health, whether it's income, or whether it's privilege. And this is why the Ontario NDP has been a natural fit for me on my own personal values and the belief that everyone should have an equal opportunity to thrive. So like a lot of other people here on the call, the candidates, I'm a first time candidate and I'm running because of my frustration of how the gap between government talk and government action seems to be getting wider and wider these days. Uh, this is something that the final straw really for me was my two and plus years kind of helping out with the COVID response here in York region and working with other colleagues on the front line to help protect our community. This is something that I did with pride but I felt that our task was made 10 times more difficult because the inconsistent leadership uh, that was provided at the provincial level. I'm now focusing my frustration by providing a positive choice to Newmarket Aurora residents about the political issues that we face today and the future uh, that we wanna see our community for 20, 30, 40 years from now. Now, full disclosure, I don't actually live in the riding of Newmarket Aurora. Uh, and I've been jokingly saying that even my wife is not going to be voting for me in this election. But I do live one kilometer south of Wellington Street, and my kids who are 10 and 13, they were born at South Lake. My natural life has gravitated north to Newmarket, and I would say that I've truly lived, worked, and played in the Newmarket and Aurora communities. So, um, so when I say that these are our communities, I, I really do mean it. Knocking on the doors and talking to residents, I, I feel like the issues are very clear. The cost of living, affordable housing, a strong education for uh, education system for our children, a dignified environment for the aging Ontarians, and trans transitioning to a greener economy and society. Honestly, these are the same issues that were brought up last election, the election before that. I could go on, right? Uh, we have an opportunity to judge the progress that Ontario has made and to hold our elected officials and parties accountable. But although, although the issues are the same, uh, I think one of the great things about this is that our starting points for solutions differ slightly between parties, as well they should. But it's too simplistic to turn this debate into an orange, good, blue, bad discussion. Uh, I firmly believe that we all have parts of the solution to the issues that face our community. And that the main differences will be our priorities, our timelines, 
and our commitment to action. So my campaign is centered on the principle of fair, just government policy that benefits communities, not only now, but for the future. We're stronger together than as individuals. The NDP finished second in this riding uh, in Newmarket Aurora uh, in 2018, and I'm looking to build on that momentum. The NDP is committed to meaningful action, not just words and unfulfilled election promises. And I hope that you enjoy the next 90 minutes and find this meeting helpful as you decide which combination of political action and candidate values might best represent uh, your riding on uh, after June 2nd. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dennis. So we're gonna go on to our first question. And um, I combined some of the questions that our attendees uh, sent in to this particular question because they were different facets of the same question. And it has to do with the environment. And to be honest, we could have probably spent the whole two hours this evening talking about the environment. So candidates, please take notes, it's a long question. What is your party's environmental plan, including start date, criteria to show the strategies are working, and moving to a second plan if necessary? Areas of interest from attendees include concrete policies to deal with development and preserve environmentally sensitive lands, whether First Nations, communities, and all stakeholders will be at the table, and the elimination of all carbon sources, including your position on small nuclear power reactors to drive a carbon minimized growth economy. So with that question, if I could call upon Dennis Hang, Ontario, New Democratic Party for New Market, uh, New Market Aurora to please start. Oh, thank you very much. That is a very dense question. And I think it absolutely reflects the idea of the complexity of this issue. I think for the past, when we're talking about what's the start date to actually deal with the environment? Honestly, that was yesterday. That was four years ago. That was 20 years ago. Uh, and I believe that another four years lost towards moving us forward to a green economy, to a greener society, where we have uh, net zero emissions to meet our 2050 goals uh, from the Paris Agreement, something that we've agreed to on a global stage. These are things that we, we need to be acting on now, right? I think what uh, I agree with the Ontario NDP party, the idea that this is something that our community has to face. And our community is made up both of individuals as well as the small businesses. So this is something that one person cannot get a, uh, forward of than the other. We have to be working together and it has to be a solution that prioritizes people over profits. So when we're thinking about uh, the environment uh, and how we would move forward, I think one of the things that we would definitely say is that we would not pave over farmland. We would not pave over the green belt. In fact, we would expand the green belt with regards to the natural habitats that are so integral to the ecosystems that are within our neighborhoods, right? And the biodiversity that they hold in these ecosystems. It's something where it's like, yeah, for us, uh, without ecological assessments, we are not going to be paving highways over these areas. We will not be building um, housing, single dwelling housing to increase the urban sprawl. These are things that I think are very hard stops for us because we need to start uh, really addressing uh, the environment so that we can have a future. With regards to the economy and such, I believe that we're moving in a, a zero net, we should have a net zero emissions policy. And the NDP would definitely be uh, supporting that by surging forward with regards to the idea of uh, electrical vehicles and net electrical vehicles. This impacts the cost of living. Right now, my friends who own electrical vehicles, they're, they're laughing at me asking, so how much did you pay for gas last time? Right. And I feel like the, the conservative government did us no justice when they came into power four years ago and canceled all the incentives. I'm glad that they've seen the light and that they've decided to invest in electric vehicles and their battery and such. Uh, but if we're just constructing things and we're not helping to incentivize and make the environmental choice the easy choice, 
it's something that will be stuck here. So I say that we need to move from the status quo and we have to be forward looking and build the communities that we need 20, 30, 40 years from now in a green economic way. Thank you, Dennis. And now we'll move to Carolina Rodriguez, Green Party of Ontario for New Market Aurora. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, green environmental climate sensitive initiatives need to start Im immediately. We can't afford to wait any longer than we already have, and it would be extremely damaging to do so. As per energy production, we are, we are committed to investing in renewable energies and being solely dependent on renewable energies, being net zero by 2045. That is our goal. We will phase out fossil fuels quickly and smoothly. And for nuclear energy, we will begin to phase those out as we can, recognizing that we need them to support our zero emission economy as well. We need a carbon budget in order to do this. And we will phase out the fossil fuels by 2030. As per buildings, buildings produce 24% of our climate pollution in Ontario. We need to address that through retrofitting existing buildings and making sure that future buildings and buildings in development will be in accordance to environmentally friendly and climate friendly um, guidances. We will, we will invest $5 billion over 10 years to fund a green building program, which will create 800,000 jobs throughout Ontario, save energy and address the climate crisis efficiently and immediately. Over the next four years, we would give 60,000 jobs to people in the skills and experience, the people, the skills and experience needed to work in the green economy throughout um, a year of free college tuition, plus a year grant guaranteed work where they graduate with targeted recruitment for women, indigenous people and racialized communities. We need to build and use Ontario's mining strengths as well for electric vehicle battery manufacturing. We have such a huge supply of that and we need to use it to our strengths. We will renew the subsidies for the electric vehicles, which the Conservative government got rid of a few years back. We will make sure that transit vehicles will be electric and we will be fully electric dependent as soon as possible. This will also increase the safety of our communities and increase the amount of land that's protected to protect us from future climate emergencies. We'll expand the green belt and the blue belt. We'll cancel Highway 413. Um, we will protect the farmland that feeds us and that protects us. And we will protect the prime farm wetland and conserve 30% of nature by 2030. When it comes to climate change, our natural ecosystems, Ecosystems are our best low cost solutions for maintaining clean water supplies and providing food protection. Finally, we'll also invest in indigenous roles in this. We'll provide a, a billion dollars in funding for indigenous climate leadership, including indigenous protected and conserved areas to make sure that we are being led by the people who are closest tied to this earth. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. We'll now move to Sylvain Roy, Ontario Liberal Party for New Market Aurora. I'll start off by just thanking both Karen and Dennis here because I think they made some very excellent points. Um, I'm minded that we are in a crisis right now, and and also I'm I, I I remember vividly what a forest fire actually looks like in Northern Ontario. We have them every summer, and it's been growing in intensity and duration, and the devastation it actually has on communities uh, in the north. and And that's not even with the floods that we've been hearing about. So we are in the midst of a crisis, and we have to be aggressive on that. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, in here in this area here, I'm really mind about the green belt as well. I think. Paving over it, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, if elected, we would cancel Highway 413 be just because of the what it's, the impact it's going to have on, on the environment and 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 the protected lands and and the sensitive areas as well, like in terms of like the wetlands and so on. So. I, I agree with everybody here so far that, that that's a mistake. That's that's something that needs to stop quickly just because once it's paved over, we're never going to get it back. And, and, and in the process of paving over this land, the, the impact will be will be felt. And I think it's going to you know speed up what we're seeing now in terms of the environmental crisis that we have. I just want to be 
uh, mindful as well that we as a party, we are committed to increase the protected lands uh, from 10 to 30%. So I think that's an ambitious goal. Uh, planting trees, I think all the other parties are saying, uh, our two parties here tonight are probably saying the similar thing, not, not all the parties. But the idea of really investing in the environment and and I think this is one thing that it shouldn't even be a political issue, it should be we should all agree on these targets and achieve them in a coherent way because it's the future of our kids it's our future that's really at stake here. Um, electric cars uh, and another thing I agree with right, we need to invest in in, in charging stations and in uh, having more vehicles that will that will reduce the, the, the carbon footprint. Um, public transit is another one right an easy win if we encourage people to use public transit transit, we get them off the highways. So one thing that I, I do believe that was pretty bold on, on, our, on, our, on our proposal is that we want to make, uh, and we're going to test that for a year or so, making the transportation transit a dollar per ride. So if you're using local transit or a go train, so that will encourage people to, to hop on the train and, and use public transit more. And the hope is really that we are going to get these cars off the highways, that thus again, helping us reduce those emissions. Um, so I'll leave some a little bit of, uh, of breathing, breathing room for my colleague Marjan here, who's going to probably add a few things to the environmental uh, platform that we have, but I encourage you to just visit our website and, and definitely look at all the priorities we had set forth. I believe they're ambitious and they will meet the needs of our community, but beyond that, the environment more broadly in Ontario and Canada, I think we will have a really good thing to say. And the, if we achieve those things, it's going to have a massive impact on environment. So thank you. Thank you, Sylvan. And now we will move over to Ontario Liberal Party candidate for Aurora or Bridges Richmond Hill, Marjan Kassirlu. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, I live in Oak Ridges and, and Oak Ridges Marin is really close to my heart. And I do believe that, and I'm so confident that Ontario Liberal Party has, you know, put the sleeves up and are eager and, um, and um, uh, you know, ready to make sustainable climate action plan because we need to have really a plan that um, we we are not going to have another uh, kind of conservative government who come and slash whatever have made uh, like um, we have before. Ontario Liberal Party brought Ontario, uh, Ontario top of the uh, uh, you know efforts on climate actions and we were on top. Right now we are saying that we are going behind. What we're gonna do, we are going to be a government net zero emission by 2030. And we are going to um, cut carbon and methane pollutions by more than 50% uh, by 2030. And Ontario will be um, net zero emission by 2050 as supposed to be. We are going to achieve our goals. And in, in terms of energy production, we are going to invest more on clean energy and transition to fully clean electricity supply. We will ban new natural gas, uh, natural gas plants and phase out our reliance um, on it. And also we're going to eliminate um, the fee for rooftop solar charging panels. We need to invest more on clean energy to be able to have the sustainable climate action. And this is what we're gonna do. We're going also to support Indigenous and Northern Clean Energy Project. This is how we can build Ontario um, better. And in terms of the um, green, green, green belt, we are going to protect our green belt and expand on the green belt. And, in, and uh, also um, we are going to make sure that not only we are you know, planting the trees, we are also creating the jobs for, for young people to work on the green energy. We are also going to bring back the um, rebate for um, the electric vehicles and, and enhance it. And every family can afford to um, have their own, you know, um, the electric vehicle um, for yourself, for themselves, and also be able to have the charger in, in, in their own home. So we will actually cut the gas consumption and also it will uh, be so powerful tool to, to uh, protect our environment. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Marjan. 
The, um, the next question, some of you touched on it in your answer, but since several of our participants um, submitted the question, I think it deserves its own space. So I'm going to ask it directly. Highway 413, what is your party's position on the building of Highway 413 and would you try to stop it? And if I could ask Marjan Casirlo, Ontario Liberal Party for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill to start the conversation, please. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really huge, um, um, you know, project that will um, damage our Oak Ridges Moraine. It will damage so many, you know, um, the huge land in uh, that should be agricultural spaces. It will, you know, um, it is so hard to believe the government is paving our farms and we will end up with food insecurity and, and um, the, the future of our kids. What air we are going to breathe is, uh, is really being treated. We will definitely will, um, we will slash the um, Highway 413 and we, we will bring the money where it's supposed to be. We do have schools that kids are get let poison in the schools because the the schools are so old. We need to renovate those home, those schools. We are going to not only renovate the schools, we are go going to have, uh, you know, retro retrofit the schools to be able to have the more um, environmental, uh, um, you know, Im impact um, as well. We are going to bring that, um, the $10 billion that is going to be spent on highway for the first you know, face, we're going to bring it back to the education where it's supposed to be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marjan. And now if we can turn to uh, Newmarket Aurora, and if I could ask Sylvain Roy, Ontario Liberal Party, to speak to the question. I will not repeat what Marjan just said. I'll just make it clear. We are going to cancel Highway 413 because, frankly, it's not a good thing for the province, and we want to reinvest that money in education. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. And we will move over to Newmarket Aurora, New Democratic Party, Dennis Hank. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with uh, the Liberal Party with this. We would cancel 413. I think the big thing is really it's, uh, it, we, I believe that it's not the right choice. The idea that if we build more highways uh, on land that is ecologically sensitive, I don't think that's the way that we're looking for building our communities 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, I don't think that uh, the argument about how, oh, this is going to increase or sorry, decrease commute times. Uh, as an epidemiologist, I know the pollution that comes with more encouraging more traffic, encouraging more cars on the roads. Right. I don't think that we should be paving over this. And at the same time, I feel like uh, the idea of urban sprawl is something that we should be actively uh, going against with regards to what we want our communities to look for the future. Uh, this goes against the whole idea of public transit and intensifying the population so that we can actually give public transit a chance outside of the downtown areas to succeed. Uh, and and once again, I feel like the Conservative government is pointing us in the wrong, uh, wrong direction here. All right. Um, I, I think what I'd also add for here is I know that it wasn't added in this question, but the Bradford bypass, I think everything that we said with regards to 413 would apply for the Brad, Bradford, uh, Bradford bypass as well. Uh, and, and I think the big thing that I continue on is like, well, we're not trying to uh, decrease business here, right? I think given the science, given the lack of environmental assessments that have been done, and future report, uh, the reports that are 20 years ago that said that this would be a disaster for our environment, uh, there are better ways, different alternatives of opening up existing laneways, building the existing infrastructure to allow the appropriate um, and a timely flow of traffic through uh, to our different communities to continue to support our uh, local businesses. Thank you. I'll leave the Thank one you. minute for <laughs> others. Nobody takes it. It's just gone. Thank you, Dennis. It's gone. If Oof. I can now call, if I can now call on Newmarket Aurora Green Party of Ontario candidate Carolina Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're all unanimous consensus. We are. I am unequivocally against it. 
as are the Green Party of Ontario, we don't need new highways. And we would also be canceling this plan, uh, like on other unnecessary highways, like the Holland Marsh Highway and the widening of Highway 417, as well as a, a Bradford Bypass. Um, the proposed Highway 413 will cut through 2,000 acres of prime farmland and will crisscross two major GTA river systems, damaging 75 wetlands and cut across 85 waterways. The highway not only will cost $10 billion to save 30 to 60 seconds of commute time, more time will actually be saved by investing in public transit and actually taking cars off of the road instead of diverting them into other places. More highways also means more congestion. Fully, we are fully committed to stopping urban sprawl as well and building livable, affordable, connected communities instead of sprawling outwards, building within. Um, we don't want any more hours spent in expensive soul-crushing commutes. We want to be able to live and work in our own communities, and highways will not help us do that. As for public transit, we will immediately cut transit and fares at least in half for at least three months across all Ontario transit systems, including municipal, GO, Northland services, and um, it will also help people avoid the soaring costs of gas as well. Um, and yeah, other than that, super against it. And I'm glad that we all are as well. Thank you, Carolina. The, um, the next question, I'm gonna combine uh, two questions in under the umbrella of healthcare and long-term care homes. The first part is, what do you see as the biggest health care challenge now? And the second part is, Will you reinstate strict regulations and frequent unannounced inspections of long-term care homes and bring all such homes under the authority of public health rather than for-profit care? And for question number three, we are going to start off with Carolina Rodriguez for the Green Party of Ontario, Newmarket Aurora. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the biggest challenge that we have in healthcare is a lack of funding. As we've seen, we've, I'm sure we've all experienced some hospital stays or visits to health South Lake, and South Lake is the epicenter for hallway healthcare. That is just not right. We need to help them expand and account for the influx of patients that they're experiencing. We also need to repeal Bill 124. This bill is putting caps on the salaries of healthcare workers. And this is just not right because the work that they're doing is far too important to cap the money that they deserve to earn. Um, another issue with healthcare that we have is the lack of funding for dental health as well as mental health care. These are very two very important pieces of healthcare that would be preventative measures and save money, not only money, but also save a lot of public suffering by investing in them. As per um, long-term care homes, we also need to reinvest in those. There has been far too much neglect and privatization in long-term care homes that does not account for the protection that our elders and our seniors need to live fulfilling and long lives. We're all gonna get there. So we all, well, if we're lucky, we're all gonna get there. So we all need to invest in caring for our elders. Specifically, we would be building 55 thousand long-term care beds by 2033 and 96,000 by 2041 to meet that growing demand. Um, we would phase out for-profit long-term care homes and stop licensing for-profit, stop licensing new for-profit long-term care homes to actually ensure accountability in our long-term care homes. And they're not just here for the money. We will also repeal bill uh, 218 that will shield long, that now shields long-term care home owners and operators from their liability for negligence. So we need to remove that off the table and make sure that the owners of these homes are responsible for the people that are living within them. Um, we will also create new responsible system for formal oversight that will ensure this accountability within the long-term care homes and not have the atrocity that we face throughout the pandemic where so many lives were lost because of their placement inside of these homes. And that's all I have to say for that. Thank you, Carolina. If I could now move to um, uh, Sylvain Roy, Ontario Liberal Party for Newmarket Award. 
I want to uh, echo some of what Carolina said as well. Um, my dad has advanced stages of dementia and this is all happening in our family during COVID. So we were hovering between home care, between long-term care. And uh, I still remember going in a long-term care facility where we put my dad, no, my, my mama has health care issues as well. So she couldn't care for my dad for a while. And he was, he was transferred to long-term care facility. We walked in and we just saw a bunch of older people with dementia warehoused in different rooms, no social interaction, no rehabilitative programming and so on. And that was a problem before the pandemic, but the pandemic really highlighted the gaps in care that we have in the province. And to see my dad and to see family members stuck in little rooms, uh, and with no engagement and, and no ability to socialize in a meaningful way and the trauma that ensued, right? I think the, a, lot of, um, a lot of our seniors died in long-term care facilities. So I don't want to understate that, but the families who can know, not be, we were not allowed to go see the, their family members in long-term care facilities were impacted as well. So it's traumatic for everybody. And, and the lingering impact of that will be felt for years. And I'm really proud of one of our commit, commitments uh, to end private long-term care facilities, because I think that was a major problem in the province. Uh, and we want to make sure it does not, that that does not happen again. And that if we do investments, or do invest in long-term care facilities, that it goes for not-for-profits and municipal, municipally run kind of agencies to care for our seniors. Because I think they've worked all their lives. They deserve something. They need something that's humane and something that's ethical. So definitely, I think, and uh, all the other two parties here have very good points about that. It's, uh, and uh, long-term care, again, should not be one of those political footballs that uh, one party decides to do one thing or another. It's one thing we need to fix, period. Um, COVID highlighted as well the workforce challenge. We've lost nurses, we've lost long term uh, uh, PSWs and long term care facilities, and home care was impacted as well because of a lot of inequities, the salary caps, all these kind of things, the bouncing from one home to the other in terms of staffing, and and PSWs need to do multiple shifts in multiple homes just to make ends meet. I think at the end of the day was another thing that really uh, hit home for me that we need to fix right away. So we need to rebuild the system. It has to go away from private more to public and municipally run. And after that, we might get at something and and those warehouses because they're not. That's not the way to go, and that's not certainly not, some, it's not a way I want to age. Um, as I retire and so on. So I, I want a society that cares for me and, and, and in such a way that's humane and ethical. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Silva. And now I'm going to uh, ask Dennis Heng, Ontario New Democratic Party, New Market Aurora, to speak to the question. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for the question uh, for the people who submitted this. This is something that I really find is, I, I always find these questions difficult. What is the biggest healthcare issue? Really, because I, I think that it kind of distracts from the idea of saying, if there's one biggest issue, the idea if we fix this, everything will be all right. And I think it takes away from the complexity, the nuance of it. Really, it's the, it's the system. It's the continuity of care that we need to be working towards to improving, right? It's not just simply, oh, if we build another hospital, well, that's going to be amazing for healthcare, right? Because I know that a hospital isn't the building. The hospital is the people that are inside it, the healthcare workers that uh, provide the care, provide the compassion with regards to it. So I think there are a lot of things here that I would always thought Ontario NDP would find com um, a commonality, right, uh, with the other parties that we would be building towards the idea that I find that I, I don't know how uh, profit competes with compassion. And in for-profit long-term care homes, I feel like that was an element uh, to, the, to the delivery and the COVID response. So my, uh, the NDP would take that away, just like some of the other parties, right? We would transition to a not-for-profit uh, long-term care sector. But really, the long-term care homes, those are the last places that we really want to be putting our, our, our aged Ontarians, right? A lot of Ontarians, as they age, as their demographic gets older, they want to live in age in place. They want to have affordable housing themselves so that they don't have to be in a long-term care home. So I think the investments that we, the NDP is having with regards to improving home care, 
improving community care, allowing um, P, uh, personal support workers and other healthcare workers to really be able to provide the support that they need within the community so that people are able to age in place. Uh, so really I'm thinking about the continuum and how complex the healthcare system is and really wondering, okay, who's the government here that's going to have the political will to start tackling this like big, <laughs> great big hairy problem, right? If we tackle it where it's just one issue, one issue, one issue, I'm not sure that we're going to get to where we need to go because the minute we fix something, something else is going to break. Right. And I think we need to have a systems approach here where we're not doing only one thing, that we're doing all of these items in concert together to really provide um, provide not only Ontarians, uh, aged Ontarians, but Ontarians of any age, the health care that they need, whether it's in a long term care home, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's in the community. Thank you, Dennis. And if I can now ask Marjan Kassirlu, Ontario Liberal Party, for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you so much. Um, one of the, yeah, actually, I would like to um, belt on what um, my colleague uh, Sylvain Roy actually mentioned about the long term care facilities, as I have been uh, involved in um, leading. A project in, in long-term care homes in Toronto and York region. And I understand that uh, we do have long-term care homes that we still have not only um, elders, but even younger people in nursing homes. We do have people with disabilities in nursing homes that then they do have a life in front of them and we just undermine their needs. What we're going to do as a government next, if become if be elected, we are going to bring care to people's home. We are going to build on the home care and make sure people can receive the treatment needed in their own home. So the family members don't get you know, frustrated with the uh, pressure that they have to bear to, to take care of their loved one and be empty handed once they do not have the you know, governmental support. What we're going to do, we're going to send PSWs and nurses into people's home to provide that care. We are going to downsize the nursing homes because the COVID shows us, you know, the having 600 people in one, uh, you know, building and running, uh, you know, um, um, long-term care facilities as hospitals is not going to be any good for us. We're going to downsize to create more homey environment for people who has to be in long-term care facilities if they cannot stay longer with a home, home care model. And we're going to invest more on staffing. You know, the staffing crisis is really uh, a tragic, real and, and, um, and crisis in Ontario. And what we're going to do, we have to hire more healthcare workers. We, we, we will actually hire 100,000 more healthcare practitioners full time to work in our hospitals and cover the backlog that we have for surgeries and procedures. Because the surgeries and procedures are not because only we don't have enough infrastructure is because we don't have enough staff to cover the shifts. And also we are going to increase the number of hospitals. We, we need to invest more on hospitals to, uh, to provide the support people needed in every single corner of Ontario. We have communities that people underserved because there is not enough infrastructure. I work as a nurse in Humberville Hospital. I have a patient coming from, um, you know, up north, even, um, you know, um, 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 close to Barry, come to do dialysis three times a week in Humberva Hospital is not correct. These people need to be treated fairly and have access to their care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marjan. Um, some of you dealt with this question, but again, it was submitted from several people, so I'm going to ask it in its own right. Bill 124 which restricted compensation to 1% within the public sector and highlighted within um, this question were teachers, doctors, nurses, PSWs. There were actually a list of people who were highlighted in this. The question is, would you repeal the legislation and would you hire more professionals in this job? And so if we could start off with 
Carolina, Carolina Rodriguez, Green Party of Ontario. Thank you, yes. So as I pre previously mentioned, um, I the Green Party is committed to repealing Bill 124, which caps the compensation to 1%, which would actually end up in years after would end up making teachers, PSWs and doctors lose money because of inflation rates, which is at 6% currently. So we would immediately revoke Bill 124. We would also revo revoke some problematic sections in Bill 106, which would also account to the fair compensation for work. Um, we would allow healthcare workers and nurses, most of whom are women, to negotiate fairly for the wage increases that they deserve as well. So we would not remove that autonomy from them. Um, we would also co contribute to this effort by providing minimum hourly wage of $35 an hour um, until that can reach $35 an hour for, uh, for registered practi practical nurses and $25 for personal support, wor support workers. Um, we would also hire a lot more people by investing in their education. So we would invest in the education and training of these professionals to make sure that we have a solid workforce for the future and make sure that we can are able to hire more people to work these difficult, grueling jobs. We can't ignore them anymore. And we've really noticed how the pandemic has put our healthcare system under so much strain and it truly is on the verge of breaking down, if not has broken down in a lot of places. Because of this inadequacy with compensation and with, with employment and jobs in this area, hospitals are facing the strain. So we have, we have a lot more people in hospitals that could be at home or in long-term care homes being cared for by the professionals that actually know what needs to be done and that can care for them adequately. The 20% vacancy rate for nursing positions and lead to overworked and underpaid positions. This also goes for teachers and doctors and the most important people who are the backbone of our society and we cannot continue to diverse, divest in them. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Carolina. Um, and if I could then ask uh, for New Market Aurora, Ontario Liberal Party, Sylvain Floyd to respond to this. I concur. I think Bill 124 was an absolute nightmare, a mistake that this government made. I think our, uh, and we saw that during the crisis that we had with COVID-19, it just just showed that disrespect, a level of disrespect, I think, uh, for teachers, for nurses, PSWs, and actually made the pandemic worse, our response to it much worse, right? So absolutely, we would repeal the bill, uh, there's no question, and allow for uh, people to uh, have bargaining rights in the sense if there's a union that needs to negotiate the rights and for teachers. And, uh, and I think, Carolina, you mentioned um, the uh, the inflation, right? 1% is way below what, and when you consider cost of living, affordability, and so on, uh, everything's it's skyrocketing. And if, you know, if our nurses can't even afford the basic uh, aspects of life uh, in, in the region, in the city, you know, it, that they take that to work as well. So we expect so much out of them, uh, but we're not giving them what they're, they're, they truly deserve. So absolutely, I'd, I'd go, at, our party is committed to repealing that bill. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvain. And now if I could ask Dennis Hank for the um, Ontario New Democratic Party for Newmarket Aurora to respond. I think this is one of the examples of the questions where this would have been a much richer, richer discussion if we were able to have had uh, some of the thoughts from the conservative candidates within these two ridings, right? Uh, I what. I don't have much to add here really, because the idea is that yes, we would repeal Bill 124. Uh, I know that Sylvan said that it was a mistake of the previous government. I'm not even sure if I can give that as the benefit of the doubt, because they made a conscious decision to this. And when I think about how they celebrated healthcare workers, the heroes of healthcare during the pandemic, uh, yet at the same time, the idea that uh, Bill 124 is still something that was coming, I really wonder, it's like, uh, is this the type of leadership that we want to continue uh, with regards to this province? I think one of the things is that, yeah, 
Uh, some people have said uh, when I've been discussing this at the doors is that, well, why, why do we care about Wall 124? It's going to be uh, it's going to be done at the end of this. It's a three year term. And I think the big thing here is the idea that with the Ontario NDP, this is not something that we would even consider going into our uh, that we wouldn't even consider if we were to form government of reestablishing this at this time. The idea is that um, I believe in the collective bargaining uh, process, and I feel that it is unfair and it's unjust to have one side participate in the collective bargaining uh, process with one arm tied behind their back. Um, in, in some ways, people might say that it's not actually collective bargaining. Uh, so I, I think this is something that, uh, as a society, we have to have a very serious discussion about how much do we value these public sector workers that provide the care and compassion within hospitals, within long-term care homes, within schools, and the idea of what, uh, how do we value this from a salary standpoint, right? And is the solution to this issue to tear people down? Uh, based on the salaries and the jobs that they have that are able to pay uh, for the needs of life? Or are we going to try to build people up uh, to decrease that gap between those that have the most and those that have the least? Thank you, Dennis. And if we could now move to Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. And if I could ask Marjan Kasirlu, Ontario Liberal Party to speak. Thank you. Um, you know, I am a registered nurse myself. And to me and my colleague, Bill 124 it was slap in the face. I'm telling it as not only because it applied to nurses, it seems discriminatory, you know, policy. Facing, you know, kind of, you know, um, forcing the, uh, the most, um, the, the teachers, the, the nurses, PSWs, the profession which is mostly run by women. And I feel this is something we need to really be cautious about once we are talking about conservative government. We need to be really inclusive. And also we need to make sure it is not going to happen again. As liberal uh, government, we are going to repeal Bill 124 and also the section of one. Uh, 106. And we also will make sure the nurses and teachers have been compensated fairly. We are going to increase the number of nurses and teachers. We are going to increase uh, higher, um, more nurses and hire 100,000 nurses, doctors, and healthcare practitioners into our healthcare system. And also we are going to hire 10,000 teachers and 5,000 special educators into our schools. We need to really build on what we need to have for fruitful and prosperous communities. And nurses and teachers are the forefront of it. We cannot have sustainable healthcare in Ontario without um, healthy communities in nursing field. We cannot have sustainable future for our kids without having um, um, enough teachers to teach our kids. We are, we are going to cap our class sizes in 20 so we, we don't overwhelm our teachers, make sure they are feeling, you know, um, ready to take care of the kids that they have received to, to teach. And this is really important concern. Our nurses, our teachers have been facing in the last couple of years on their fourth government. We are going to make sure we are giving the chance for the um, you know, nurses and teachers to thrive and also help our, our, our next generation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to group two questions together uh, under the theme of indigenous people. The first part of the question is, how will you bring Indigenous people into projects that infringe on their rightful land? And the second part is, how will you ensure that real and immediate action is taken to provide clean water to Indigenous communities? And we will start with Newmarket Aurora, Green Party of Ontario, um, candidate Carolina Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So the Green Party has put Indigenous people at the center of its platform, especially our environmental policies. We understand and believe wholeheartedly believe that Indigenous people have the right to have a voice and deserve to be there. Um, we would start by implementing UNDRIP to ensure the equity of Indigenous people in all of Ontario. We would establish a truth and a true nation to nation relationships with indigenous people. We would work within them, with them, not beside them or against them. We would genuinely work with them to support land defenders and assert their, to assert their treaty rights and actions taken to confront the threats of their traditional lands. For clean drinking water, we would have to work with the federal government. And if they would not be willing to, then we would be asking them to fund our efforts to work to build um, clean water infrastructure. What we need to do is invest in these communities. We need to be able to transport the infrastructure that is necessary there and that is able to be done. We just need some effort to do so. Um, we would provide a billion dollars in funding for protect for protected and conserved areas, which would also contribute to the clean drinking water in their areas. And we would not prioritize corporations over their lives. We understand that Ontario is a big um, mining province, but that doesn't need to come at the cost of indigenous and first nations groups throughout. We would also on, in conjunction with working with the federal government, we would immediately end all boil water advisories through the protection of their water systems, protection of their land, and through the investment in their infrastructure. We would also restore funding for the Indigenous curriculum program, per, curriculum program and work with Indigenous educators directly and community leaders to develop a mandatory curriculum on colonialism, residential schools, treaties, Indigenous histories, and experiences. For a long time, we've ignored these things and we've done them um, not with the full effort that we could. A third thing that we would do is make a national day for truth and recon reconciliation, a national, a statutory holiday. We introduced that this year and it was a very big moment, but we didn't make it a statutory holiday, which makes it difficult to celebrate wholeheartedly. We would also improve the availability of supports and services in other languages in remote communities, as well as the far north that would prioritize um, French language, indigenous languages, and make sure that those are all a part of the Ontario government um, policies and accessibilities. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, and now if I could ask Newmarket Aurora, Ontario New Democratic Party candidate, Dennis Fain to respond to it, please. Uh, yeah, um, there are a lot of good things here. And I think it starts off with the land acknowledgement that we had for this meeting. Uh, and I think the really challenge here is that we need to do better, right? I think all parties need to do better. All of society really needs to do better. And the idea that once again, we're guilty of saying the right things, right? But we need to get to transformative action. Uh, we need to disrupt the power structure here. Just like we are all immigrants or children of immigrants to lands of the indigenous people here, we're all talking a good game, but really it's the actions that will really play out what we should do. I, I don't think that we need to do a lot more uh, planning or talking. We have the plan in front of us. We have the truth and reconciliation. This is something that we can see. What is the progress that has been made? And the idea that we have not progressed far enough right now. I think the big thing that we're committed to do as the NDP really is once again, working with indigenous people, peoples, working with their communities. Uh, and really it goes more than just working with them. It's the idea of empowering them. And I think this is something that I look at what government has done. Government is not very good at giving up power. And I think that this is a, quite the issue of a power issue, that if we are actually going to get to justice for Indigenous peoples, that means that we have to give the power up and provide it to them, right? Uh, this kind of goes along with the idea of uh, the, the, the gap in society. Indigenous, uh, indigenous peoples are definitely uh, those uh, groups in our population here in Youth Market and Aurora, as well as the rest of Ontario, that I would say are not some of the most privileged uh, in our society. We have the expertise to really address drinking water, right? We have clean drinking water in our cities right now. I know that I can go to my tap in Newmarket Aurora and I can get a glass of water there. 
Uh, I don't have to have a bottled water or such. And I think these are the expertise that over the next four years from the next provincial government, really, this is a really easy way to see how accountable we are and what progress we have made. So I think the big thing really is once again, working with Indigenous communities, providing them with the supports and really getting to the meaningful action. Uh, because we've said a lot of words, we've spent a lot of time thinking about plans and really it's just having the political will to move forward. Thank you, Dennis. And if I can now move to Ontario Liberal Party for New Market, Aurora, Sylvain Floyd. Yeah, and thank you for that question. And thank you, Dennis and Carolina and everybody else on this call, because I think there's an alignment here that we need to prioritize Indigenous peoples. Um, I'm reminded uh, when I was growing in, growing up in Northern Ontario, my mom used to love bingo and she would drive us to a place called Aroland, which is a small native reserve about five kilometers from where I live. And she dragged me along, right? I hated bingo, but she dragged me along and, and I, I would play with the other kids um, in Aroland. And I still remembered, and this was in the nineties. And the first time I, I, I entered that res reservation, they had one well for the entire village of three to 400 people, a well. So, the, so no running water in the homes and no, that means no toilets. So in the winter time in Nikina, it gets to minus 40, minus 50 sometimes as well. So just think about that scenario. We're in the nineties here and that went on for years and years and years. So no drinking water. Um, they would have to go sometimes to rivers and fill up their buckets and bring them home. So that image of, of where we are and you know, the realization of the privilege that I had growing up in, in a middle income home, I had drinking water, and we're just three, four kilometers away here from them. Drinking water, I had a, a, a roof over my uh, over my head, and and that struck me as a at a young age that something wasn't right. And in in more recent times, I'm just reminded as well about all the burial sites we've been hearing about as well. Growing up, I didn't fully understand um, the impact. And, and the trauma and, and the experience Indigenous peoples have, have suffered because it was never, not really discussed in schools. It was not really discussed openly. And I saw this, but I didn't understand this as a child. And now in, in retrospect, I think there's so much more we could be doing to support and just, and just and water, drinking water is just one basic human right that we should have. And Dennis, you made, you just mentioned, we have the technology, we have the ability, and it boggles my mind that it takes us so much time to get drinking water and in, in, in our, in our reservations up North and, and throughout communities uh, in Ontario. So definitely, I think our party as well is committed to working towards this issue. It's not like the drinking water. I think it might not, like you, you mentioned Carolina, the federal government, I think this is a, co a coordinated effort. We need to work towards that truth and, recon and reconciliation. It has to have meaning. And at the end of the day, I think, yeah, the culture, preserving the culture, the language, all these things are important, but more importantly, I think we just have to listen. And then when something needs to be done, we just need to act on it as well. And that's that, that that's the, that's what we need to focus on. There are a lot of issues, mental health, trauma, all these kinds of things we need to support Indigenous peoples. And I think we can do it, but listening and, and, and you know, action is needed. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Sylvain. And now if I can move to Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill and ask Marjan Casirlu, Ontario Liberal Party to respond. Thank you. I think this is really important question and I, I love to hear this question have been raised here. Um, you know, we need to really be care careful about how we are uh, going to talk about indigenous communities. We need to first learn uh, the pain they went through and we need to teach our kids. This is this is top, on top of my uh, priorities when I talk to my, my son about the our, our Ontario and our Canada, and talk about the, um, the the painful history behind the residential schools and teaching our kids. I think this is our responsibility as adult to continue build on 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 those issues. We as Ontario Liberals will make sure this learning will continue. We need to bring this learning to our schools. We need to bring this learning to our communities. We will invest on First Nation public libraries so people can go and learn. We will actually make sure that we um, 
uh, make the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation and a statutory, uh, statutory a holiday so everyone can sit and reflect on what happened before of us. And we make sure we are building on, on the learn lesson and um, make sure we are building on, on the future of indigenous people as well. The, you know, having the boil water advisory shouldn't be a di discussion. I think we are going to, as a liberal, we are going to make sure we are working to, toward safe, clean drinking water for uh, our indigenous communities. We are going to restore, reserve wetlands and water sheds for indigenous communities so they can rely on. And also we are going to build up on the, uh, you know, make the indigenous community stronger. We are, we need to actually spend uh, and fund uh, on, on, on uh, indigenous um, childcare. We need to make sure we are investing on businesses, small indigenous small businesses. We are going to bring $25 million for indigenous small businesses so they can thrive, they can be empowered. And uh, that empowerment will actually make communities stronger. And that was we're gonna do. We are going to make sure we are um, building 22,000 new homes for office off reserve indigenous communities for families so they can call a place home. And uh, this is really, really a small pieces of uh, what Ontario Liberal will do and we will make commitment that be uh, forefront on, on working with indi indigenous communities for the policies that we need to bring. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next question, that was actually a very good segue when you mentioned homes, because the next question is on housing. What specifically do you want the government to do to help with housing unaffordability and lack of affordable rental options in this riding? And we're going to start off uh, with Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill Liberal candidate, Arjan Kasiri. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, I'm hearing this question over and over again at the doors. This is really close to people up on our Rock Ridges, Richmond Hill. And I know so many, uh, so many families are reaching to the point that their, their youth adults are going to leave the home. So they need to have their own nest. And what we're going to do, we are going to build homes for, do, for these individuals. 1.5 million new homes we will build over next 10 years. And it's going to be really, um, we are going to be thinking about complete communities. We're going to be thinking about having communities which built for different purpose so people don't have to travel three hours uh, a day to, to reach to their, their destination. So the homes that will be close to where they can find a job, the homes that is close to amenities, they can have community centers, hospitals, you know, um, uh, the, the, the um, schools, enough, you know, infrastructure to build homes around our community. And we are not going to use, um, we are going to actually make sure um, it's not going to be um, in the sake of abuse of MCOs as we are seeing by um, Doc Ford. And we are not going to build homes as um, Doc Ford is announcing to build high rise in Richmond Hill, uh, like um, which not really, taking, uh, completely taking care of the people who are going to live there. You know, we are going to make sure the homes are complete and we are making sure we are, uh, there, you know, there are so many lands that uh, receive the permits, but, you know, uh, developers are not building on it. We are making sure we have the enforced policies that uh, the developers start making homes on those you know, lands that has been planned by municipalities. And we make sure the people who, um, there are options for people who wanna rent homes and, and the people who can rent and paid off 
once they actually uh, reach the threshold that they can actually own that home. So the youth can have possibility to, to plan for themselves to be able to be homeowners sometime. And uh, also we are going to make sure we are, um, we are banning non-resident ownership for new non-resident ownership because we do have empty homes across our writing and even once I'm knocking on doors there are uh, I'm seeing many vacant homes in our writing this home need to be used by our people if someone comes from overseas to invest in our um, in our land thank you Thank you. And if I could now ask uh, Sylvain and Roy, New Market Aurora, to speak to the question, the growth market. I'm very fortunate to have Marjan here. So that means my remarks can be a bit shorter because you've said all the important stuff. But at the end of the day, I think that we have to remember there's not a one size fit all solution to housing. And there has to be multiple, multiple, type, multiple types of housing that we need to consider about. There's definitely a shortage. We're hearing that left and right. Uh, and we have to start building. We have to really invest and really, you know, we can't leave the markets decide at this point in time because the prices are roaring everywhere, whether it's on the rental side, whether it's on a home ownership side. And we have to, you know, we have to act on it. And government has a role to play here in, in, in helping with the supply, but also the other issues that Marjan mentioned that is kind of not helping the affordability issue. And I'm thinking like supportive housing, social housing, rentals, first time ownership. And there's one thing in particular that resonates with me as a young family. I, I'm a dad with three young kids. I, I was fortunate. I bought my home five years ago, but I would not be able to afford this home today if I were to buy it or look for a home. So a lot of young people out there have no options. I've met one young lady today that was living at home with her parents. She just finished university and she was saying, my boyfriend and I are looking for a rental, but we can't even afford that right now. So I think it's a story that uh, I think all the candidates here have heard at the doors multiple times. It's in the news and it's really, it's an, it's an elections issue. Um, so we have to start thinking about this, the, the, what are we going to build and, and, and where and intensification to some extent. And Carolina, your party is one thing that I, as a homeless advocate, tiny homes, I think it's something that resonates with people that could have a, a drastic impact on, on, on the housing supply issues that we're having now with folks that could benefit from it. But I'm also want to add the supportive aspect of men, like the mental health component. A lot of folks in, 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 in the region, Toronto, York region, and even Ottawa, everywhere, there is a need for supportive housing where, you know, they, there has to be some homes available, but then the supports as well. So to me, housing is, is vast. It's big. We have to build, we have to invest, and we have to do it quick because I think the affordability crisis is getting worse. So I really appreciate that question. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Carolina Rodriguez, Green Party of Ontario, New York at Aurora. It's yours. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Sylvain, for, for mentioning that because I believe that housing is a right. And I think a lot of people do here do as well. And we also agree that we need to build homes, but it's not just about building homes. It's about building with a purpose. We can't just keep building in, on the sprawl and extending and extending our neighborhoods because that won't contribute to the affordability of them. That'll just continue, contribute to the unaccessibility and the car dependency that we face day to day here in Newmarket and Aurora. Um, we are committed to building these homes in a way that's climate friendly and also neighborhood friendly. We also know that housing affordability is not only dependent on the supply, but it's dependent on govern government regulation. Homes were expensive four years ago and they're only getting worse now. And if this continues, I will never own a home. <laughs> Uh, we need to. We also need to implement a multiple speculation homes, multiple home speculation tax. So this would mean that people with multiple homes would be taxed on those owning um, three and above. So on their third home, they would face a tax, which would discourage the multiple home ownership and the for-profit ownership of homes. We would. In this building of homes, we would also require a minimum of 20% of affordable units in accordance to the local income levels. So we won't just build them, but we'll make sure that they stay affordable. We'll also reinstate rent control and implement a vacancy control limit so that rent doesn't increase in between tenants. Specific specifically for new homeowners, we will end blind bidding. 
This will significantly reduce house, housing prices as it increases the transparency in the purchasing process. Um, we'll also make inspections on homes mandatory so that buyers aren't left with expensive um, refurbishing and expensive um, restructuring of the homes that could have been done at the seller's expense. This is also all going to be in accordance with our 15 minute communities, which increases the accessibility, the affordability and the transit of our community itself. It'll be a place where you can walk and cycle and work um, and live and play all within a short 15 minute commute, which would be either walking, cycling, driving or through public transit. We will also freeze urban boundaries to stop the sprawl. We will work with municipalities to change uh, zoning laws so that we can actually have our triplexes, quadplexes, tiny homes and walk-ups and everything that actually reflects different types of living in Ontario and not just one type of family. Last thing I wanna say is we will retro, uh, produce grants to retrofit housing to reduce the cost of utilities. Once you own your home, you don't wanna pay skyrocketing prices for the use of natural gas and we want you to be able to afford living within it. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Carolina. And if I could now turn to Dennis Hain, um, uh, Ontario Democratic Party for uh, New Market Aurora to respond. Sure, absolutely. I, I think once again, this is one of those topics that if we had a PC candidate here to kind of provide that full spectrum of what uh, the plans are for affordable housing, I think this would have really enriched the discussion. Um, for me, I think that, yeah, I, I don't think that the Conservatives are pointing us in the right direction with regards to affordable housing. Uh, increasing urban sprawl, uh, building highways and building more single detached to dwelling homes, uh, even though that's, uh, I don't think that's affordable housing. I know that I can't afford it. And I'm in the same boat as Sylvan that if I had to buy my house right now that I bought 15 years ago in Aurora, I wouldn't be able to afford it. And I have a 10 and a 13 year old who just like Carolina is the idea that I really wonder if they'll be able to afford a home in Newmarket and Aurora. Uh, because honestly, the bank of mom and dad has other issues that we're gonna have to deal with uh, moving into the future. But I, I really think that affordable housing means different things to different people. And I think that's the biggest thing that we need to do as a government to provide choices choices to people at all levels of income. So whether it is we're talking about affordable housing for people who are ODSB, if we're talking about affordable housing for new graduates that are trying to move out of their parents' home, if we're talking about affordable housing for uh, aged Ontarians who are trying to downsize, I think those are the options that we need to get to and start building the supply. But once again, I feel like this is something that I disagree with the vision that the Conservative governments have. Uh, their use of the MZOs and the idea that in the town of Richmond Hill, they're building a transit-oriented community, which sounds great, but they totally trampled over the plans of building a complete community that the town of Richmond Hill had. Instead of having commercial on the bottom and residential on top, with green space so that we can build the 50 minute communities that I totally agree with Carolina. Doug Ford has decided, no, we're gonna be building all residential 60 to 80 story homes. Uh, and we're gonna force these people to commute along the public corridor down to downtown Toronto because there won't be jobs in the local area. So I think that once again, I'd kind of challenge uh, the liberals and the idea. And I say, I, I don't think we need to think a bit more about what the affordable housing is. We actually have the plans and the Ontario NDP government really would respect the autonomy of the local municipalities who know what's best for their communities. And we would be doing everything to support them to enact the affording, affordable housing plans that they have to build along the public corridors, to increase intensification with commercial uh, usage on the bottom and really to start building complete communities. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, the, uh, uh, our, the attendee just asked for a yes or no, but I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm not sure that's really fair. So I'm gonna ask the question 
And I'm going to suggest that if you would like to elaborate beyond a yes or a no, uh, we, will, we will certainly allow that. And the question is about the right to choose. If a free vote was held in the legislature to support continued public funding of abortions and women's right to choose, would you personally support these bills? Uh, yes or no, uh, but you can say more than yes or no. And we're going to start off with Newmarket Aurora, candidate uh, Aurora, um, Ontario New Democratic Party, Dennis Hang. It's an unequivocal yes. Um, I, I really believe that kind of uh, building on what Marjan has said with regards to women's equity uh, and the idea of my, my background with regards to public health, I do believe that um, uh, women's health, uh, this is something that is an absolute yes um, from me. Thank you. Um, and now if I could go to Newmarket Aurora, uh, Ontario Liberal Party, Sylvain Floyd. A woman has the right to choose. I don't even know why it's coming up. And frankly, uh, I think the news in the United States is really, um, it, it's kind of shaking some of the things that the core beliefs that we have in, in Canada now. And I think it's very important for us to reinforce that. Um, the decision for abortion, for example, should be between a, a woman and, and her medical provider, for example. So right to choose. Thank you. And if I can go over now to uh, Carolina Rodriguez, uh, Green Party of Ontario, New Market Award. My answer is a wholehearted yes. Uh, people have the right to choose whether or not they would like to give birth. And if it has something to do with a medical issue or a personal issue, this should not be discriminated against regardless of what their circumstances are. Um, not providing free and fair abortions and health care for people who give birth is an issue of equity um, because we know that it, people who don't have access to this will be the poorest in the society, will be the people that aren't able to make it to clinics and that aren't able to fly to different countries to get the access that they need. So if we start legislating this out, then the people who are have the privilege of being able to leave and go somewhere and get the health care that they need will be able to do that, but it'll be the poorest who aren't able to. So this is not only a woman's right issue, this is not only a gender right issue, but this is an issue for everyone and it should not be anything less. So, yes. Thank you. And now if we can move to Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. And if I could ask Marjan Kassirlu and Tara Liberal Party to respond. So to me, actually, is definite, definite yes. Um, women need women should be able to choose uh, if they need to, if they want to give a bird or not. And this is this is um, you know really strong, really strong uh, issue for many many young women. And uh, and we need to make sure they do have a chance to to decide for their own uh, life. And, and uh, it will actually impact uh, even a kid who is going to born and, um, and have, have a ha happy life. We need to make sure uh, we are, um, you know, taking into consideration that women has a right to, um, you know, choose how they wanna live and, and uh, for the better sake of uh, the kid who is going to be born as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to take one more question before we do closing. I have to tell you candidates, you've got a lot of door knocking to do because I have a list of questions that we're not getting to, but we will take this next one and it has to do with education. Um, and the question is, what will you do to provide post-secondary education for the training of personal care workers to serve francophones in your region? And if we could start the question off with Aurora Oak Ridges Richmond Hill Liberal candidate, Marjan Kassir. So I will start actually with uh, the um, important conversation that we had with our Francophone candidates in our uh, slate. So one of the important part of the inclusivity is to make sure that we bring the we, we, we will bring 
uh, all aspects of you know life and also make sure the people who are living with and and they, they speak with different languages have been uh, taken care of not only uh, the francophone but also I'm, I'm thinking about even the immigrant with different different cultural background and we do have that uh, important issue in our healthcare system that uh, we make we need to make sure we can serve people as best as they can understood and as best as we can we can serve um, I do have myself sometimes, you know, challenge because I don't know French and unfortunate, I have to learn from my son. He started learning French and teach me. And uh, I do believe that we need to um, have that, uh, you know, extra layer of understanding of each other. And, um, and this will not be done without us uh, knowing uh, the language. And um, for sure, this will be included into, you know, the francophone, uh, you know, part of our platform is completely robust and uh, have been delved into every pieces of our pl platform and inclusivity itself is uh, really uh, important in, in our platform. And um, thank you so much. And I do believe that uh, even not only PSWs and personal support, uh, personal uh, support worker, personal care workers, uh, but in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, nurses, uh, the healthcare practitioners need to be able to communicate with uh, people uh, from the fran francophone communities and also uh, from, from people who are immigrated in Canada many years ago, but they are struggling, especially once they age, they need someone who can speak in their own language. And I think this is an important part that we need to delve into a little more deeper and um, be able to serve. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if I can now move to uh, Carolina Rodriguez, New Market Aurora, Green Party of Ontario. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm also not a fluent French speaker. I did take it all through elementary school and high school, but um, even with that, it wasn't enough to make me a fluent French speaker. I do actually speak Spanish fluently. That was my first language. So I do have that under my belt. Um, but yeah, I agree. I don't think we've been investing enough in French education and especially in New Market and Aurora, we don't have enough formal French education programs that we can, um, expand our own skills as adults. There's more, um, youth centered. So, uh, to expand that would be necessary and to be able to give a variety of language access and services is also necessary. Um, not only that, but we also need to address the issue of OSAP grants, um, four years ago, OSAP grants were significantly reduced, which affect a lot of, affected a lot of people's capacity of uh, rejoining um, the education force or joining it at all. A lot of people had to opt for work instead of education or opt for loans instead of actually being able to just be free after their education. So we would reinstate those OSAP, OSAP grants that were lost um, four years ago. We would also invest in our healthcare training specifically for PSW care, um, which would then also invest in more jobs by also repealing Bill 124 would be adequately paying for those jobs. Um, we would also create incentives to increase the number of French speaking individuals in teachers college programs so that more teachers are also fluent in French and can actually um, help with the education of French and transmission of that information. And also just making more awareness of these programs that we do have. We do have them. They just perhaps are um, not in everyone's reach and need to be more broadly known. But yeah, I agree. I think we need, as Ontario, to be more fluent in French. It is one of our national languages, and we should be able to communicate with people throughout the country in more than one language. So thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, if I can now ask Dennis Hang, uh, Ontario New Democratic Party, New Market Aurora, speak. Merci beaucoup pour l'opportunité de répondre à ces questions, même si je ne suis pas un francophone. Uh, mes enfants sont, uh, je suis un francophile parce que mes enfants ont leur première langue de français. Um, I figure I'm totally wasting my time right now, but I, <laughs> luckily this is not a debate in uh, Spanish, but yeah, I'm not a Francophone, but I actually am a, 
I don't even know what the English word is. Francophile, French lover. I don't know. Uh, my my kids are in the public school system for French, and their first language is French, thanks to uh, my beautiful wife and such. But I think the big thing here really is providing the opportunity at a post secondary level with regards to once again taking our expertise, taking our education, and having it taught in the language, uh, in the French language so that our skilled healthcare workers, our skilled workforce is able to have that technical knowledge in the French language and is not trying to translate that on the fly. And I think this is shown through support of the French speaking language universities and funding them. Um, but I also agree with Marjan here. It's like, uh, even though the question was specific to French, I think this is something that we definitely want to think about for other languages, right? And maybe this is filled by the foreign trained workers as we try to bring people in. Uh, as a healthcare worker, um, kind of in the public health setting, I know that if I had to have a, <laughs> a health appointment in Spanish, I'm not going to be able to adequately express my needs with regards to um, what my healthcare needs and appropriately advocate for myself. So I'm all aboard with regards to not only uh, Francophonie, but also the culturally specific uh, uh, delivery of healthcare, delivery of services, because uh, York Region, Ontario, it's a very diverse place, if you haven't noticed. And it's something where we need to be welcoming to everyone that lives here and provide that comfort with regards to language and impress, uh, expressing themselves. Uh, so with regards to kind of like the post-secondary education, I think there are definitely ways that the provincial government can support uh, the planning of what we need, not only for French and other languages, in my mind, we have good census data. We're one of those countries that had good census data. We have an idea of uh, the different languages that are spoken in our community. And I think there is an appropriate way here to actually, I don't know, use data, use planning to <laughs> figure out what are the resources we need to help uh, support the populations that we have in our communities. Thank you. And if I could now turn to Sylvain Roy, um, Liberal candidate for New Market Aurora. And you know what? You could answer this question in whatever language you choose. It will not be Spanish because nobody will understand a word of what I'm saying. Uh, mm -hmm. But as a Francophone, uh, I think, it, like, I was just going to start by saying it's an excellent question. It's an excellent um, We have to remember that for Francophones, um, it, you know, there's about six, seven hundred thousand Francophones in our province. And it's it, healthcare and education, it, it, those are hard, complex question. I still remember, you know, I, I mentioned earlier my mother has health conditions, but I, in, she had to drive to Thunder Bay for medical appointments, um, but she could not communicate in her native language. She does not speak English. So every time she went to Thunder Bay, she would talk to her medical doctors, nod her head, and, you know, basically could not necessarily understand. So in her mind, she kind of understood, but did she really understand? And a medical error ever happened one day where she took the wrong medications and it impacted her kidney function to the point where she required um, uh, dialysis and so on. So this is a traumatic uh, and critical uh, incident that should not have happened, particularly in Thunder Bay where there's uh, enough francophones. There's some cities in the province where there's a, there's a baseline of francophones. There should be some available medical services of, of available in French. So th this is one, one of many stories we're hearing in Ontario with francophone services. Um, I know the, the, the person who asked the question mentioned PSWs and retirement homes. So we do have francophone professionals in the province, actually 10% of uh, roughly of psychologists and nurses um, are uh, speak French. But the issue for francophone is that francophone professionals also serve English and other languages as well, because the, the English is the, the do dominant language. So when it comes to francophone seeking a family physician that could communicate in French, for example, the wait times are so much longer because that one physician you could possibly go in a York region that speaks French also has a long wait list of many other people. So for francophones, it's become a core issue because 
basic care is not be able, and we can't find it. And the same thing with ECEs, early childhood education, daycares for francophones. Now, I love the fact that people are going and, and trying to get into bilingual programs and so on. This is great for diversity in a province. And Frankie, you mentioned Spanish, Carolina. I think we, any, we should have more and more language. The more language we speak, the better. Uh, but it's become a critical issue for francophones in a province because basic services are no longer available to them. And it's really hard, especially when it comes to medical. Um, so for us, uh, and we've pushed hard behind the scenes, any, and we have a big workforce strategy that we're pushing forward with the Liberal Party, but a big part of that will be Francophone workforce. So whether we're looking for Francophone psychologists or social workers or nurses, physicians and so on, we want to make sure that we carve a little bit of it for Francophone services and make sure we, we produce more and more professionals that can speak the language, again, to expand access to basic uh, fundamental services like healthcare. Thank you very much. And um, now we're going to go to closing remarks. We'll go in reverse order of the uh, opening remarks. So we are going to have two minutes each. And if we can start with New Market Aurora, Ontario New Democratic Party candidate, Dennis Peng. Great. So thank you again to everyone who has participated in this evening's candidate meeting. Um, I know that uh, unfortunately some people sent their regrets and hopefully they'll be able to watch this and see what the other parties are all about. I know that on June 2nd, New Market Aurora will be sending a new MPP to Queen's Park to represent our community, our values, and perhaps most importantly, our local issues. And if you believe that Doug Ford has done an amazing job over the past four years, I would encourage you to vote for him because I think that's the great thing about democracy. If you believe like myself, though, that the Conservatives are not pointing us in the right direction to build the community that we need 20, 30, 40 years from now, I ask you to think about who might be the best candidate to represent our local issues. Uh, there's a reason why I'm not running in Toronto right now as a candidate. I wouldn't be able to do ju them justice with regards to the local issues that they have. But at the same time, I feel like that this is my community and this is something that I am truly passionate about to be the strong local voice for this community. So regardless of the results on June 2nd, I'm still going to be living and participating in uh, New Market Aurora as a, as a community. I'll be advocating for a community based on the same values that I presented to you today. The idea that we're stronger together as a community rather than as individuals. The idea that we should be working together. Uh, there's no need to be insulting other political uh, parties, right? And that we have the different, uh, I guess, with regards to solutions, all about. Uh, I guess the big thing for me is as a government, the NDP will not prioritize profits over people, but we're committed to setting up an environment where local communities can achieve sustainable success. And for me personally, the only question that I'm asking myself is whether I'd be influencing from Queen's Park or whether I'll be advocating for New Market Aurora. So thank you for your time. I hope that this was helpful. Thank you, Dennis. And if I could now ask uh, for New Market Aurora, Ontario Liberal Party, Sylvain Rortos. And Dennis, I was going to say, I would actually ask the Conservative voters to reconsider possibly putting a vote for, for, for the Conservatives because they're, they're not showing up. So at the end of the day, we have no idea what they're standing for. So I, I would actually maybe say that. But I'm trying to recap as well. In summary, I've heard a lot of questions tonight. We've heard about the environment, healthcare, and long-term care, Indigenous relations, housing affordability. And these kind of like, I'm glad that I, all these questions came up because this, this is exactly what I'm hearing in the community right now. Um, and, and the one thing I want to say is I'm, I'm committed to work on these issues at Queen's Park. I think they're, they're critically important right now in this day and age. We need a government that's really going to help us get on track and start focusing on the issues that matter to folks. Uh, and I think affordability is probably number one right now. But tonight, uh, I was hoping we talk a little bit about mental health as well, because it's an another thing that we, we've heard of loud and clear as well, and the availability of services and people have suffered dramatically under COVID. And I think the idea, uh, any recovery that we want to do what should include mental health. So perhaps in the next debate, we can talk about mental health a little bit more. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, the library for organizing this. It's been phenomenal. I've enjoyed actually talking to all of you tonight. It's been very pleasant. I've learned quite a few from the other parties, the other platforms. So I think it was
was a very good conversation. And uh, at the end of the day, too, one more uh, kudos to libraries, the innovation you guys have done during COVID. Uh, me and my kids have been benefiting from going to library. Even like it's it's amazing that you guys are still running in a way, but you guys are strong. And I and for organizing this debate tonight, I think it was it's an important civ uh, civil responsibility. I want to thank you for that. So thanks for the, the other candidates on the line today. That was great to have you and, and, and hear from you, the audience, the great question. And at the end of the day, if anybody has any questions about our platform, I would just encourage you guys to reach out to us. Uh, you can look us up. My name is, uh, my, my website is Sylvain Roy at OntarioLiberal.ca. If you want more information about the platform, please reach out and I'd be happy to answer any of questions you might have. Thank you, Sylvain. And now for New Market Aurora for the Green Party of Ontario, Carolina Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much again to the Aurora Public Library and for the organizers of the event that made this possible and brought us all here. Um, my fellow candidates and I, I know we're all privileged to attend these types of events and address the issues that matter to everyone the most. Um, I also like to thank my fellow candidates for sharing your opinions and teaching me a little bit about your own um, platforms and what we agree or um, also need to work on as well. Aurora as a whole, it's a vibrant community and it has, it has addressed the need to reap the benefits of leading in the new climate economy. There's a lot of work to be done to ensure that folks have access to safe and connected community, but it needs to be one that prioritizes people. We need to also make sure that we can provide a good quality lifelong learning to train the prosperous workforce of the, of the future and by investing in education, not by divesting from it. We need to make sure that we also invest in our healthcare infrastructure and personnel because hallway healthcare is frankly unacceptable and mental health is health. Housing is a right and it should be treated as such. We must build more homes, but we must also build them with a purpose because it's one thing to have an affordable housing plan, but it's another to have an affordable living plan. And for the election on June 2nd, I truly urge you to vote on how you feel you will be best represented in Queens Park not just what you think would be the best strategic move or what would get someone out that you don't like to be there. Please vote for what you believe in and what you, what party you feel would represent you the best and has the best interest for yourself in mind. It's the most important thing that you can do in our democratic process. So thank you for having me again. Thank you, Carolina. And now for um, Aurora Oak Bridges, Richmond Hill, if I can ask Marjan Castillo, Ontario Liberal Party for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Aurora Public Library for organizing this amazing event. Thank you, Rashia, Claudia, and Lucy uh, for hosting us. And thank you, um, the, uh, the audience that um, brought really important issues that we are facing in our communities. And we want to make sure we are addressing those issues right in Queens Park. As a registered nurse with, um, uh, with integration of business administration into my practice. I have served our writing. I have served our uh, seniors in long-term care homes and our elders in daycare programs across Ontario. And I do believe that I can bring that expertise in policy, um, plot and, you know, policy, uh, creating policies. And also um, I do have that, you know, expertise on listening to people. I think one of the most important parts of the government, one of the most important parts of the job of a government was to listen to people. And this is what we need to do. This is my commitment to Aurora Oak Ridges Richmond Hill to be the voice of Aurora Oak Ridges Richmond Hill in Queens Park, to be your, your uh, representative, the one that can listen to what our writing needed and be the voice in Queens Park and advocate. I have been advocate for entire of my life and I will continue to be advocate even though I may call politician. Thank you so much for having us. And I do believe you will have a strong voice by, by uh, choosing Liberal Party in Queens Park. I do recommend, please go on my website, marjoincassilu.ca and look into our platform, completely costed and ready to go with amazing a team that is going to work hard for you. And I really appreciate to get to know more our, uh, you know, candidates, um, Caroline and Dennis, and I do, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Marjan. So as we come to the end of our event, 
I have to thank our candidates for giving us uh, this evening of their very busy time and really such thoughtful responses. Um, I think we're in good hands. So if I could just call out for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, Marjan de Sirlu, Aurora, Ontario Liberal Party, and for the riding of Newmarket, Aurora, Carolina Rodriguez, Green Party of Ontario, um, Sylvain Roy, Ontario Liberal Party, Dennis Peng, Ontario New Democratic Party. Thank you to our guests for coming this evening, for your intelligent questions, your engagement in the democratic process. Good night, stay safe, and don't forget to vote. Good night, everybody. Au revoir, merci. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.